Domatic Theology and Holy Canons, you are expecting maybe too much from me and I ask for your understanding, uh, distinguished audience. Given the difficulty of uh, the issue and the uh, penury in time, I only used some of this time for this elaboration. So, uh, Dogmatic Theology and Holy Canons, as a point of departure for this discussion on the relationship between Dogmatic Theology and the Holy Canons, we should be accepting two main assumptions or maybe questions. The first one being, do we really need canons? Couldn't we say that canons are but a form of discount from the genuine Christian life, which is characterized by charismatic love and the freedom of uh, the brothers uh, that comprise uh, uh, this um, society? Or is it a term of sanitation of the church, the setting of uh, the canons and uh, the councils for the canons in the margin of uh, ecclesiastical life and theology? Couldn't we say that canons are a nuisance, something uh, that is uh, foreign to the genuineness of uh, the ecclesiastical experience which should be relativized or even abrogate rather than promote in the name of a more genuine and more original orthodox Christian life? The answer to this question is clearly negative. The Lord of the Christian Bible and Church is the Lord of order and not the Lord of chaos and anarchy. There is no disorder in the Lord, as Apostle Paul says. The Church of the Christ has a specific shape and structure, as Athanasius says, the organic uh, structure of uh, the Church as the body of the Christ presupposes a specific order that originates from the very essence of the Church. The canons are not a product of uh, the introduction of the, uh, uh, the law in the Church uh, after the first uh, charismatic uh, period, as Jean uh, suggests. It is the um, result of the basic structure of the church that has been always present. The church is a community that establishes a body of the Christ that is called to uh, specifically obey to it. The love of the members of the church uh, for Christ and uh, for one another, as well as the love for all other pe persons outside the church, are conformant to the uh, doctrine of the Christ and the expression of this love is subject to laws. Moreover, uh, the church is not fully identified with the kingdom of the Lord. The church is holy, but its members are incomplete and sinful, just as the world around them. The church lives and uh, goes through the history of this world, the eschatological uh, dogmatism, or, according to Athanasiev, the ecclesiological uh, uh, monophysitism is a negation of the reality and history. Besides, the projection of antinomism in the name of love uh, uh, disregards the fact that love is not the negation but the completion of the law. The canons of a church that adores, uh, meaning obeying and following Christ, do not undermine, rather they secure the identical uh, the identity of the church. The problem of the genuineness of the church is not solved by marginalizing or abrogating canons. Rather, it is solved by opting for uh, adopting and implementing appropriate rules, the canons, those canons that are not just compatible with but conformant to the nature and the identity and the mission of the church as uh, the body uh, in uh, the name of the Lord of the Christ. The dogmatic theology neither identifies with the positive law nor does it contain it as part of it. The canons of the church are an expression and implementation of uh, doctrine and dogma in the life of the church. Canons, as Athanasius suggests, do not establish the basic structure of the ecclesiastical organization as expressed through the ecclesiological uh, dogmas. Rather, they regulate the appropriate structure of the church for the church to be able to reveal in the best possible way its very essence. We may even add that the relationship between theology and canons um, ascribes the wider systematic relationship between practical and systematic theology and may even be uh, seen in parallel with the uh, relation between theory and science and uh, application thereof. The dogmatic theology may not compensate for the non uh, strict or sense with theological approach of canons. It is therefore not a main pursuit of theology and dogmatic to propose specific canons. The role of dogmatic is to structure the necessary theological and theological constitution for the adoption, uh, interpretation, and implementation of ecclesiastical canons. The canonic uh, law of the church may not be positive law for the church in the absence of theology of the church. It may not become the canonic uh, law of the church unless it obeys 
the Lord of the Church, and unless it in, is inspired by this Lord, just as uh, it is estimized by the theological uh, approach. This is how the legitimation comes. With these observations, I believe we have in part answered and tackled the latter very fundamental question as a point of departure, meaning whether the church is entitled or even obligated on one hand to reconsider and decodify the existing uh, canons, and on the other hand to adopt new canons and um, provisions. The answer to this question comes by itself. If so, you are, according to Elder Kimov, uh, these canons are external, changeable expression of the non-changeable part of dogmas. Uh, canons are the incarnation of theology of the Church uh, in certain local and historic conditions. Uh, just as these conditions are changing, and along with them the needs or the potential of the members of the Church, uh, inevitably they are being reconsidered and even amended or left to become inert. Uh, and uh, naturally, new canons are also about bound to be adopted, which has to be uh, done cautiously uh, so as to avoid any superficial and non-justified uh, secularization of the Church. Uh, uh, the spirit of the canons should remain inalterable, inalienable, not the letter, but the spirit. The more deep spirit and not the letter of the canons are is truly directly associated to the dogma, which is the unalienable uh, faith in the church. According to the above, I would like also to stress a series of fundamental theological principles that govern many of the uh, applying canons, uh, as well as contributing to the more correct adoption of new canons and uh, canonic provisions of the church. First of all, Christ is the head of the body of the church. The church is not a human community, the members of which may be believing in and confessing in Christ. The church is the body of Christ. It is the community that the Christ himself has structured as part of his body. Its members are his members. They're members of the body of the Christ. The Christ is the Lord and the head of the church. This is uh, he uh, to whom all members conform so that in this way and the only way possible to structure the church, their relationships are uh, founded on uh, the interaction amongst the members and all of them with Christ. This fundamental assumption has two uh, fundamental uh, Effects. First of all, the members of the church ob have to obey the Lord, and in the epicenter of uh, the various committees, commissions that uh, adopt, amend, or abrogate the canons, the Holy Bible and the uh, Gospel should be ascribed. The members of the church are not a, a human organization. They are not entitled, nor are they capable of uh, adopting canons uh, in the absence of Christ. The canonical law of the church it is not just a use humanum. Uh, the uh, uninterrupted procedure of institutional uh, structure and reorganization of the church may only be uh, obtained through a spirit of obedience to the Lord. The only justification for the ongoing uh, adjustment of uh, the canons of the church is the need for a deeper and more complete uh, apprenticeship in the Lord in a uh, constantly changing world with conditions that are dictated by the diaspora. Secondly, the very fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Church means that all of us are brothers in Christ and uh, His disciples. Uh, we, uh, no human being, no group of people may even substitute or represent the Lord. Any hierarchical or other uh, differentiations within the Church may be accepted or necessary without for that being distinctions amongst brothers that are all pupils uh, towards the same master and who in spirit of brotherly uh, equality uh, follow the Christ. The teaching and the will of the Lord is the ultimate criterion for any justification of any canons that have in every case to secure the lordship of the Lord and the brotherhood of the brothers. Any rule undermining uh, the masterhood of the Lord if uh, uh, going against uh, the doctrine of the church, uh, any canon undermining this brotherhood by promoting the interests or the pursuit of one person or a community or a group vis-a-vis -vis all others may under no circumstances be considered a canon of the church. Secondly, the church is uh, structured in the body of Christ uh, through Holy Eucharist. 
um, the visible construction and uh, uh, revelation of the church is obtained through adoration and uh, during uh, the uh, process of Holy Eucharisty. Uh, the body of Christ uh, is for all the image of Eucharistia and it uh, materializes through this mystery and the participation of all the faithful and the body and the blood of Christ. The rules, the canons of the church should be facilitating the construction of this Eucharistic uh, body. Who and under which criteria would be considered to be member or non-member of the church? Who is entitled or who is barred from participating in the mystery of uh, Holy Eucharist and what is this all about? What are the criteria and process for the um, designation of the officers of this mystery? How are they being ordained? How are they being uh, entrusted missions? What uh, uh, and why do we close the doors of the church? Uh, how the entire body of the church participates in the entire Eucharistic uh, process? How the community of Eucharistia is connected to the bishopry or all bishoprics amongst them, the diocese, and how the Eucharistic ethos is diffused uh, before and after uh, the uh, structure of the church. Our church theology reminds us that the canons most above all concern the construction and the operation of the Eucharistic body epicentered in Christ rather than bureaucratic structure of a cosmic uh, secular organization. Third, Christ has come not to uh, serve, not to be served, but to serve. The uh, pupils of uh, the Christ are committed not by the word, but by the life and the uh, example given by Christ. The Lord told his disciples that uh, uh, the heads of the community should be those who are serving the community. And as a model, he uh, highlighted his own uh, self by saying that I am amongst you as a, a servant and not uh, something to, uh, someone to be served. I'm here to serve you, not to be served. Consistently with the above considerations, the relationship among members of the church are not power relationships. They are uh, deaconry uh, and servitude relationship. This is the absolute model the church is following, adopts, and uh, even preaches through the crucifix. The canons of the church may not pursue the facilitation of anything but this servitude and in that sense uh, canon should be clarifying the criteria, the conditions and the terms under which uh, the various servitude of the church are being entrusted. Uh, it, they should highlight the holiness and the importance of all such servitudes to facilitate if not obligate every member of the church to undertake a specific servitude if and provided he or she wishes to be a pupil and a communing and communion to Christ. Uh, they should be promoting this idea as the ultimate objective of this servitude. Last, we should like to remind all that uh, servitude uh, only implies obligations, not rights. It is not serving the person who serves, it serves the church. Uh, serving the church does not concern only those within church, but also people besides the church. The Church of Christ is not a community of people that collaborate for the um, consolidation of their own rights. The church exists to serve uh, the human being uh, in favor of which uh, Christ uh, went on the cross. The rules, the canons that regulate the life of the church in other levels should reflect the obligation of the church to associate with uh, the human community as a serving church. Fourth, the church is unique, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The canons have to secure the unity of the church. Um, that uh, all of us being members of the church is a kind of prayer and an order uh, by the Lord of the church. The canons of the church aim, amongst others, at uh, protecting and even uh, fermenting this unity. The unity of the church is not something that alienates and levels, rather something that respects the particularities of the various churches in the triadic model. Uh, this is not secured by an autocratic imposition of an inflexible canonistic orthodoxy or of those who are meant to secure it. It's a unity of order within the context of uh, freedom and love. Canons, nevertheless, besides securing unity, also secure the holiness of the church. It is a uh, economic temptation of the church to include in its uh, body anyone uh, in the name of a false unity. Uh, those uh, who implement the canons should bear in mind that already since times of Ananias and Sapphira, 
or of uh, uh, the church of Corinth. The church was very strict against all those who incestuously polluted its holiness. Uh, there's only always a risk for the church to uh, high to overvalue its holiness and become a Pharisaic sect of the pure, or to indulge in a, a very primal uh, d- deracination of the uh, pests uh, in the name of Christ but there is also another risk for the overvaluing of the unity to the detriment of holiness and forget that the unity is a unity in the holy it is a communio sanctorum the canons of the church should be securing the very fragile equilibrium if not the identity between the unity and the holiness of the church The same applies uh, as far as the third holiness of the church is concerned, its Catholicity. Uh, I will limit myself to referring to the Catholic character of the truth of the church. There are more than one ways whereby such Catholicity may be transgressed, the overvaluing of a strictly perceived uh, orthodoxy that is not uh, um, consolidating truth is so risky as the dogmatic relativism. Zelotism and ecumenism are equally uh, risky temptations for the church. Church temptations vis a vis which uh, dogmatic theology of the church and uh, the canonistic expression thereof have to protect us from. Those defending a uh, prejudiced orthodoxy uh, are a detriment to the church, just as those who are playing with dogmatic uh, relativism. The church theology and its canons should be protecting us also from both such extremes. Fifth point, the church is uh, in a, a duty of uh, confessing. This is about the apostolicity of the church. There's a mission. The church is an apostolic church, amongst others, has a duty to continually and to all directions uh, express the apostolic confession in Christ. This confession, of course, is not this witnessing is not just an assumption, this is not just a scenario, these are words and acts, not just preaching about but living the church. Since this life is governed by rules and canons, such life should be also demonstrating through canons uh, that uh, the church is a witnessing of the Christ. Such witnessing addresses itself to the world, to all those not as yet members of the church. Uh, A more recent uh, narration of the social contract considers that a human being is uh, violent and uh, avid. Uh, For this to be remedied, the state should be able to protect every uh, citizen or any group of citizens vis-a-vis the rest. The church, on the other hand, is not a community of controlled, of covered or uh, pronounced violence. It is a community of love and conciliation. It's a brotherhood, community of brothers in Christ. It gives people the witnessing that the human beings do not need protection, they need conciliation. The love is what structures the identity of the church. Uh, in that, everybody should be um, in agreement that uh, love is amongst us. The church is not just a community, just as any other community, because uh, its Lord is not a Lord of uh, just uh, any master. The church already, at a time of secularization, should never uh, indulge itself in the error of seeing itself in the eyes of others, meaning as a social or religious group or as a religion, just as any other social or religious group or religions uh, suggest. The internal structure of the life of the church should be revealing the world that this is a community of pupils of the Christ, uh, a community of truth, of brotherhood, and of humble service. This is an inalienable duty and mission of the church as an apostolic community. Besides the world in the generic uh, sense of the term, the witnessing of the church and its canons also addresses more specifically the state. The state is not and may never become church. Nevertheless, if the state has eyes, it may see in church the city that is above uh, the mount, uh, the state that by its rules determines the conflicting interests of its citizens and the various social or professional groups forming part of this community. And in that state, to that state, the church should be giving the opportunity to uh, see in its life the 
operation of canons that govern the servitude, the state, the citizens of which are united in the name of common interest and pursuits vis-à-vis -vis other states and peoples, should therefore have the possibility to see in church and in canons the unity of love, of uh, servitude, and the responsibility vis-à-vis -vis all peoples and all nations. The, uh, city, the, the city of the world and the state of the world should be uh, getting the example of Christ and the church. It should be reminding the state that there is only one Lord and one master, even if the state does not know that. The church knows the state better than the state itself knows it its own self. The laws of the state contravening the laws of uh, the Lord may very easily turn societies in uh, gangs of uh, malfeasance to remind August, Augustine and uh, uh, just remembering the, the European history of the 19th century is enough. We should know that every member of the church is expected to see and treat any other member of the church and any human being not as an antagonist or a threat, nor just as a fellow citizen or a fellow uh, human being, but in every way, in as deeply as possible, perceived as a brother. Six point. The church is structured in body of Christ in the Holy Spirit. The church, uh, in its human face, it um, is neither entitled nor is it able to become subject of uh, the expression of the dogma and its uh, canons, nor can it be the subject of uh, the uh, officiation of the mystery of the Holy Eucharist in the absence of Christ. The, per, the he who officiates uh, is Christ in the Holy Spirit. The apostles and the fathers of the council knew that when they utilized the the phrase, it appeared well for the Holy Spirit and ourselves. Our literature shows that the uh, grace of Holy Spirit contributed to you, Christian, that the Holy Spirit is the one that restructures the whole institution of the Church. The Eucharistic uh, mission of uh, sanctification is in Holy Spirit. We do not possess Holy Spirit, but we invoke it. The Church invokes the mediation of the Holy Spirit for Eucharist and for the establishment of Eucharistic body, as well as to formulate the dogma and its canons. The construction of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Church, amongst uh, others, means, first of all, that the Church is something living. The Church uh, uh, where the uh, Holy Spirit transpires in a living way is a living church, the Church of the Christ going down the path of history, facing continuous problems and new challenges. N consequently, the church is entitled and even obligated to specify and um, uh, interpret the ancient canons in a modern way and also to adopt new canons expressing the spirit, if not the letter necessarily, of the ancient canons. The church has always done that and will always be doing that. Secondly, uh, when it comes to a church inspired by the grace of Holy Spirit, there is no room for an inflexible and sclerotic uh, theoretism. Uh, charismatic canon is a word, and the Holy Spirit uh, bestows uh, this charisma of distinction, which uh, in the domain of positive law uh, is referred to as economy, an economy also implemented by the uh, spiritual fathers. Much was said about economy yesterday. May I add something secondary, maybe not so important, but saying that economy is not just about whether a canon shall be implemented or even transgressed, but whether the implementation of this canon should prevail over others. But economy is most above all the exactitude of the matter in all cases. Otherwise, this is not an economy, it is an antinomy, and uh, the Holy Spirit is not a spirit of chaos, it's a spirit of order, but also a spirit of freedom, the freedom uh, given to us by Jesus Christ. The antinomy is meant to the virtue, the uh, presumed ataxia is against the spirit of the uh, church, just as the legalistic approach is not compatible with the church. The transcendence uh, in Holy Spirit of this uh, uh, theoreticism uh, would be against uh, any effort to stay too close to the letter, uh, undermining the freedom of the local churches to adjust their canons to the conjunctures of uh, their uh, dioceses. And in concluding, I would say that the need to re 
consider the canonistic law of the church. Our church disposes of a very ample corpus of rules governing their li its life and uh, operations. Such canons, just as a multitude of relevant provisions, uh, uh, have been adopted in various times and in various places by different people or groups of people. Uh, they uh, are meant to govern various aspects and uh, problems more or less successfully. In certain cases, they do provide for different things. Sometimes they are even contradictory. And there are cases when they are deprived of any sufficient theological justification. Some of these canons may refer to problems no longer of relevance today because we are living in different times or under different circumstances. Other canons have been uh, abrogated by the practice of the church, correctly or not, or substituted by canonistic provisions or terms. And last, there are also canons, the uh, concept of which we fail to grasp for the life of the church. Whatever the case, canons in its non-organized form uh, presented in the Pedalion, which is one of the digesta, may not always uh, offer our church uh, the services uh, required for an appropriate operation. For that to happen, the church should acquire a consistent and up-to-date canonistic law codifying uh, provisions and canonistic Stipulations. For this to happen, canons should be evaluated, systemized, and interpreted historically and theologically, taking into consideration both the doctrine and the modern needs of the church. Uh, one uh, could be only an extreme theoretician uh, if one were to accept that the canons of the church uh, could operate autonomously without the theology of the church. All the more when it, uh, we know that all these canons are now chaotically dispersed that we need to somehow systemize. The relationship between theology and canons, of course, is not a uh, one way out. There, it's a two-way process uh, because many canons express clarify and retroaliment the theology of the church. In such cases, not only are we up intra and up extra movement from uh, doctrine to canons, but also a kind of interpretive cycle to remember of Paul Tillich. The dogmatic theology of the church will be assisting us not in grasping and interpreting canons, but also in implementing them as a, an integral part uh, of economy. The dogmatic theology of the church will be further assisting us in very painfully and stressfully, but also inevitably going down the path of adopting new canons that would be ascribing the spirit, if not the letter, of uh, all canons, uh, tackling uh, up-to-date problems and challenges our church is now called to face. All these may and should be obtained in a spirit of deep humility. Uh, through humility of the disciples of the Lord who uh, acknowledge the ipso jure obligation uh, of obedience to the Lord and uh, in belief uh, to the promise of the Lord that he will always be with us in his spirit to guide and inspire us to every truth through the ways and challenges of the historic course of the church to the kingdom of the Lord. Thank you very much.